Hello and welcome to the Chiswick calendar general election debate. Now, as if we didn't know, there are many ways to hold a debate. And whilst there are other candidates in the constituency of Brentford and Isleworth, we're only talking to two. The two that matter for this particular fight. Uh, the Conservative MP uh, for the constituency, Mary MacLeod, uh, whose majority in 2010 was 3.6%. That is less than 2,000 people. Uh, also, her challenger we have here, who is the Labour candidate, Ruth Cadbury, who's been a councillor in the borough for 25 years. Um, hello to you both. Good evening. Good evening. Hello, Sarah. Um, now, we're going to have a chat on... Uh, on just between the three of us for a while, and then uh, we will uh, we have a small but, from the look of them, perfectly formed audience here that we will be opening the floor to for questions that they may have of the two rivals. Um, and I'm struck by... Mary, you have been MP, obviously, since 2010, and you are known as a hard-working MP. Ruth Cadbury, you have been councillor for 25 years here, and everybody considers you hard-working. You obviously know each other. I wonder, before we get into the politics and the policy, whether whatever you think of the politics of Mary, whether actually you quite admire her. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> no, I do, because I admire any, any woman and all women who, who go into politics. It is, it is a tough world. Um, and certainly on the doorstep, I've met people who've uh, appreciated the casework that Mary's done. Uh, and I do know that, that she does work hard. And I've worked with her and been aware of other work that she's done in the constituency for the, con for the constituency. So, yes, I ha admire her in that respect. However, obviously... Should we uh, leave that, however, just to make okay. it? <laughs> <laughs> I can assure you we'll get on to it. <laughs> Mary McLeod. What about you? You know the work that uh, Ruth Cadbury does in the borough. Do you admire her? Yes, and she does work hard. I mean, I think um, what we need are lots of good more sort of politicians at a local and a national level. And, you know, in Parliament, we only have 22% female MPs. We need more women to come forward. And, you know, and I think anyone who gives their life to public service and, um, it, you know, has to be admired to an extent, you know, for that because it is something that, you know, we do need good people coming into. And, uh, and there are some things that we work together on. So things like Heathrow and the expansion of Heathrow, um, we will, we will work on together Heathrow, on. You don't you? You do not want another runway there or effectively an extended runway. And I've, I've always gone on what the residents say. So when I became the candidate first, I surveyed residents and they overwhelmingly said they were against expansion. Now, a few people are for it, but, uh, and they may or may not work at Heathrow, but, uh, but you know, for a lot of people, it's, you know, we have a plane flying over every 90 seconds. And it's just, you know, enough's enough in terms of the increase in number of planes that is being proposed. Okay. So, Ruth Cadbury, I stopped you a moment ago. Uh, you've acknowledged that you uh, admire what Mary's done in, in, as an MP, but you obviously want to take her place. If you were MP here, what would... What different focus would you have? What would you be doing that she's not doing? How would, you, how would people notice a difference? Well, obviously, I would be a Labour MP, and I would, uh, I very much uh, follow in and believe in, uh, and I'm part of Labour values and Labour priorities. So um, issues so such as... So it's a vote for Ed Miliband? It's a vote for the Labour Party, Labour Values, and, and our leader, Ed Miliband. So it, it's the NHS, it's the cost of living, um, it's, it's the housing crisis. Those are, those are, the, those are the issues that, that matter to me and to the people who would be voting Labour, and particularly for people who uh, didn't vote Labour last time and are now realising that they wish they had, because, uh, as, as we know, and as, if you, as, of, as you've already covered, uh, Mary's majority is very small. But that's what makes this an exciting election. I mean, I go around all my schools and I say to young people, if you really want to see what democracy is all about, 
then come here because it really is every single vote will count on election day and people will make the decision about whether it's a local candidate, whether it's Ed Miliband or David Cameron, they will make their cross in the box and that vote will absolutely count. So I, I do encourage everyone to go and vote um, and, uh, you know, and, and make their voice heard. Okay, well let's start with one of the big issues which you've mentioned, the NHS, which is a difficult one, has been a difficult one for this government. There's been so much anger about what the government has done uh, in, to the NHS uh, from across the country and from lots of different sides. I, do you feel that you're on the back foot on the NHS in the constituency? Not at all. Um, because we, when we started in 2010, we put 12.7 billion extra into the, the NHS. We ring fenced that budget in really, really difficult economic times when you know this country was was almost in ruin. And what we did was we said, no, that NHS is critically important. And if it was the other area, international development, we said this is really, really important. Um, the, you know, patient care and that you get treated at the point of need and protecting our NHS is 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 vital. Therefore, we're going to make sure that budget is protected even in austerity and in difficult times, and we're going to add more to it. And that was, you know, 12.7 billion has gone into it. Okay, and Ruth Cabot, it's certainly the case that actually Labour wasn't promising the same on, mo on money. But in terms of what's happened in the constituency, is this something that when you speak to people, they say, look, this is a problem? It certainly is a problem. Uh, People do not believe the, Tory, the Tories on the NHS. And, of course, the Tories uh, let people down right at the beginning by saying, uh, by committing not to interfere with the NHS and then going for the biggest reorganisation ever that cost three billion, three billion that could have been so, gone on, okay. on, on frontline services. So um, what, I'm, what, would, what would you do if you were MP that would feel different for people who are worried about the NHS? Well, first of all, uh, I, I would seek to stop the closure of accident and emergency at Charing Cross. And the, and it's the, not and closing. It's Mary, it's not awful, going to be a scaremongering story Mary, that Labour are putting about. Not, it's not closing. Mary, no, with no. respect, it's not going to be a blue light service anymore. It's not going to be run by consultants. Three blue it, light it, ambulances it, go there per day. It's effectively the going to be an urgent care centre, and people in Chiswick are going to have to go either to St Mary's Paddington or to West Middlesex through the traffic. They are worried. We get more signatures on our petitions on that issue than on any other issue. Um, but but uh, and and that's the, locally the, and I, I, we we, we haven't one, heard. We, sorry, could just, I just what, say something? Just so? one thing on that before we move on from it. On Charing Cross, the decisions on what where hospitals, uh, or at least where services, uh, are should be provided is not something from central government, though, is it? I mean, I know it's overseas. This is clinician led, so they have that, said that okay. they can it's save a hundred lives a year. Led. It is clinician led, but a lot of clini clini clinicians are very, very concerned about these proposals now. Because of the increased pressure on acute services, the rising elderly population, the rising population of West London, um, it was a long time ago that the first proposals came out, and since then the pressures have grown and grown, and clinicians are worried. We haven't seen the commitment of both capital and revenue funding uh, that, that, that is going to be needed in the hospitals that remain open, like West Middlesex. And until, and, until we see that, we shouldn't, be, we shouldn't be going any further on any closure proposal. But you did ask me what I would do. I mean, the, 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 there's at one end, we've got the acute services where we're seeing waiting lists rise um, uh, and people having to wait longer for diagnostics and, and, and for cancer referrals and so on. But what we should be doing is address it, having a root and branch uh, uh, bringing together of social care and, and, and health because we've We're still got this institutional divide in this country which makes it very difficult for the carers <coughs> of or for an old people the person themselves because they're often caught in a bind between social care and that health. We need to bring that, that together. Done. Yes, absolutely. In um, parts of the country, but are you saying it would be, sorry, just before I come to you, are you saying you would accelerate that here yes. in, the, in, in this yeah, council? Yes. Can I ask you on that? Because first of all, on the Charing Cross thing, one of the arguments about closures is, and they, that they are clinician-led, but the argument is uh, that you, what you should do is be investing elsewhere so that the services can be provided elsewhere. And one of the arguments, certainly, in this part of London is that it just hasn't been done effectively. You're closing things before you have an alternative. 
And that's absolutely not true. That is scaremongering that the Labour Party have done, and it is simply not true. So we've got the two hospitals in my constituency are Charing Cross and West Middlesex. Charing Cross is just outside, but it's used by certainly a lot of people from Chiswick. Um, and uh, the Chiswick and, and Charing Cross will look different. So it'll be a brand new hospital. The new hold 150 million pounds of a new hospital. That will, Any will that, be downgraded. I'm just saying that will not be um, a the, the old hospital will not be shut until the new one is built, so that, that eases people's minds on, on the, the transition. A &E, and the A&E the the will, will, A &E will still be there. At the moment, the majority of A&E at Charing Cross is urgent care. So um, it's only three, it blue light, three blue light services a day currently go to, go to Charing Cross. So that's, that is the potential change. So it will still be something that urgent care that the residents can go to, and West Middlesex is, is staying the same. So there, are, there, are, there aren't changes there. So I, I think this really is, I mean, we should be proud of our NHS. Mm. I mean, our NHS is, you know, renowned around the world, and, pay, and doctors and nurses who work so hard in the NHS. So I, what I hate is this pulling down of, of the hard work that they do, because what I want is that all of us, if we need it, or our families, or our children need it, that we, have, okay. we, we know we can trust the NHS. What is that if it is only three blue lights hmm. a day, then is, is this scaremongering? Well, I talk to people on the doorstep in Chiswick who've experienced services uh, and value very much what, what they've had at, at Charing Cross and are very worried about the alternatives. Um, but it isn't... It They're isn't worried a, because you're scaremongering. No, we are not And we shouldn't do this. Because I'm talking to... Who, the politicians I'm, should be honest you know, and say exactly what things I are. I am listening to people who work in the NHS who are worried about the changes. I'm listening to patients, and I'm listening to the carers and the family members of patients. And they are telling me about the reality, and they are telling me that it's not going well. We'll move on from the NHS in a minute. I just want to know, are you happy then the way, with the way it's being reorganised in West London? I mean, it is clinician-led, so they are the experts uh, rather than me. But My sister's a doctor, but I'm not. in the way that it is happening? <coughs> I, yes, because I've been to see both hospitals. I've, I've been to see the clinical commissioning group on, on many occasions, um, with mental health as well. So there's all of those services which you know I'm keeping in touch with and making sure that things are, with, with any change that happens, what you want is A, that there's better outcomes at the end and we get better patient care, um, but also that it, the transition happens in an effective way. Okay, I asked Ruth Cadbury what she would do if she got became MP that was different from you and the first thing she mentions with the NHS. If you were elected, what would your primary focus be in a second, a sec effectively a second term here? Um, first of all, school places, one of the biggest issues that, that we have. Um, you mean in the NHS or... No, no, just no, generally, no, no. generally. generally. Um, yeah, so school places. Um, great news today. We've just had two secondary schools announced um, by the Prime Minister in Isleworth. So um, that is absolutely fantastic. We're really short of school places, population growth in West London. Um, so we need to see those followed through and implemented. So that would be my first priority. I'm also chasing for teachers' pay in, in my constituency to be the same as in Ealing because we're outer London, Ealing's inner London. It's a really weird thing. And teachers should be paid the same across London because um, it's you know it's so expensive to, to live in London. Um, so that'd be the first thing. Um, keep reducing crime, a lot okay. of work on domestic violence, on more that, jobs, more apprenticeships. Schools. I saw you nodding there. Do you do you, actually, are you do you agree with what Mary McLeod said about the extra school places? I mean, they're in free yeah. schools, which was the biggest. Yeah, I mean, I, I I agree that school the school place pressure is a real problem. Uh, I disagree with the way we deal with it. I disagree with the fact that there is absolutely no local accountability uh, and local, no local engagement in where and how the new schools arrive. We have to sit back the and wait. The council has been involved from the start. They've worked really hard on it. Yes, but the, <laughs> the, but the council cannot direct. The council is, is forbidden from... Uh, initiating a new school. The council has to sit That's and wait to a, yeah, till the sponsor comes along uh, and uh, and uh, and if there's any yeah. land why do you want allocated, would, you school? Have chosen, would you have chosen somewhere different? Would you? Are they going no, the wrong it's, place? Uh, no, it's not. It's not the where. I, it, no, it, I appreciate it, that. It, I know. It, I know it, you're it, saying. Look, it's the principle. You know, we, it, don't, we, it, we don't have any say. It's, but would you have what, put them somewhere? What people different? in Brent, I mean, we we we've always for a long time we've needed a mixed non-faith 
a secondary school in Brentford and Isleworth. And you're uh, getting that. L great, but the council uh, has, has, ever since this government came in, the council has been uh, told it can have nothing to do with director that. It has to sit and wait for that to happen. Now, it so happens that the secondary heads, who actually, who've been uh, strongly um, together uh, for many years, we have a very strong partnership that used to be actively supported by the council before all of that funding was removed. But the secondary heads are the sponsors of, of, of one of the academies. Uh, the other is a, is a, is a faith school. But can um, you just but say today, it's great but, news, we've got two yes, new secondaries yeah, announced, yeah, we've got the funding. Yeah, yes, but, 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 but the first, the first free school in this constituency was a Sikh sponsored school, was the Nishkam Academy. Sikh Anglican. Uh, hmm? Sikh Anglican. But actually, the vast majority of the of the uh, students there are from a, are, are from a, a Sikh Punjabi background, and uh, in fact, the majority of the Sikh and Punjabi population in this area uh, aren't demand. We're never demanding a separate school, but because that was the sponsor that came in, they 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 were the ones who got funding from the DfE, and we could have had this funding a lot earlier if so much funding hadn't been directed to free schools being implemented at high cost in areas where there was no short. <coughs> Are, where there was no shortage of places. They are very expensive. They are... Well, well, all I know oh. about as a way to fund schools, they are very expensive. And one of the charges is that they do suck money out of other places where perhaps it could be better used. Well, the way I look at it is we, we needed more schools. We needed more both primary and secondary. We got two new primaries out of this, and today with the two new secondaries have been announced. To me, to do that, um, you know, to be able to try to, to get that through in, in five years, I think is, is is brilliant that the Department of Education have approved it. The council have been involved in looking at locations for that school. I've been trying to help them with Commerce Road and various other locations. Um, but to me, it's like we want good schools and we want enough schools, um, and that's what we now have with the, the two primaries and the two secondaries. Um, and it's critical. And you know we have to plan ahead for those, and those weren't planned before. So what, what you know I've been trying to do with the Secretary of State for Education. Um, and have the, have, were schools under the council, were they badly run? Not all of them, not all the schools were great. The schools now across my constituency <laughs> are all good or outstanding, so that's brilliant. And, but we just needed more. We needed more of them. So it, so it wasn't yeah. the, the problem more, wasn't more the way places. they were doing it, it was just more, which was effectively yeah. down to the money coming from central government. Yeah. The, yes, that's well, right. The, 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 the only way you can have a new school is, uh, is to get DfE funding uh, and, yeah. the, and, the, and the council can have no role in that. We could have had new schools. Why should the if, council be running schools? But if the, if Actually, but the schools in this well, borough are doing, running their schools very councils, effectively. Councils, we're, not the, we're not the teaching since expert, local the head teachers are. Since local management of schools, councils haven't run schools for a long time, but they've worked in partnership in schools. They've also led led partnerships in terms of new school development. Okay. We could have had these new schools two years ago if we'd been able to work and in partnership with a forward no. with a forward looking DFE. But the, right. the rising population's been quite But aren't quite you pleased marked. we've got two new primates and two new secondaries? Yes. Of, of, of yes. course it's of course I'm of course I'm good. of course I'm pleased but they could have been with us two years earlier. Okay, so let's move on on that note. Uh, to, to something you talked about, which was the housing crisis, because there has been a huge amount of development in this area, hasn't there? Yeah. Um, is, it, I, uh, is it not enough? What's the problem with, uh, particularly with development? Well, the housing crisis in, is so acute in West London, it, it's impossible for virtually anybody without independent means to afford to buy their own home. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the shortage of truly affordable um, housing, particularly for ordinary working people on average and below average incomes, uh, we ha we're able to provide about 10% of the need every year. The new government, the, 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 Mary's government when they came in, they halved the subsidy for uh, social <coughs> rented housing. Um, and uh, the, the, and uh, the combination of that and the continued incre increase in uh, subsidy to for right to buy now 100,000 pounds round here um, is that the, uh, the, 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 uh, the amount of sh social rented housing has declined and declined okay. and the demand so, has gone up and so up. So because there have been a tremendous amount of development. And the new, development, the new developments have 
uh, provided market rent housing on the whole. Some of it is some of it is owner occupied. The vast majority uh, is market rent. Not all rent. The developments have, have um, been. Uh, some developments by the council have been approved without affordable housing um, affordable housing in them, and that's for. I mean, I want to really push that there is affordable housing in every development. Well, that's very welcome, uh, so, Mary. But so it would have been nice to. Is, it would have been nice if you'd have supported um, the whole principle of affordable housing and opposed your government's cut in in the subsidy to the HCA. But Mary I, McLeod. But, but, but that, I, the, we, I've pushed the council on affordable housing. So why are the council still approving developments? No, Mary, you pushed why? the council why? on the you pushed the council on the Lionel Road development. There's another uh, one the, just now, Empire House. Uh, that's gone up. Yes. I mean, so just no, no, the for, Empire House hasn't just gone up. One the, second. The, no, there's so, just been approved. So the developments that have got the been given the green light in this area. Are you saying they don't have enough social housing, and the council should have ensured more? I think yes. So I think there should be absolutely good affordable housing in those developments and not all of them have it. And, you know, we, we are, I mean, in this area, you know, we have to be, with housing, you have, it has to be very sort of balanced how you do it. There's a lot of development going on in Brentford at the moment. Um, a, in Chiswick, the, the most recent one is was something that residents didn't want, the extent of it the residents didn't want, um, but the council went against them on that. But it's, Ruth Cadbury. In is it your argument that actually there aren't the money because because there's so much at market rates rather than more affordable? No. To, in order to provide social rented housing, either as as part of a private sector led development or as housing provided by councils or, or built by councils or, or um, housing associations, there needs to be a subsidy. Mary's government halved nationally halved the subsidy and her friend Boris Johnson has not, has he's just announced more money yeah, for he's, he's an, an, he announced an, an some, some more money but but in a sense it's recycled uh, local money and it, it, it isn't enough it hasn't been enough well there's um, never keeping you happy <laughs> yeah but, and and now but instead of having in, and on our and our planning but, and our planning policies uh, uh, our planning policies uh, uh, seek 25 percent of new units in in uh, in new developments, uh, minimum uh, being for for, for affordable affordable housing, of which only some of that would be social rented. Now it's so less than you, now it's less than that? now it's less than le less than twelve percent. Because if because you should know that the the private sector developers refuse to build them they, because they're saying it's you not make profitable. That as a as a, one of the Mary, if you had actually been on planning uh, committee uh, and actually worked as a planner, as I have done both, you would understand that you that is an unrealistic. <laughs> pro that you'd understand that that's not possible. <laughs> you take you because what, to blame because, everyone. You because, 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 the because what in happens is the developers walk away. As well as heat in a discussion, just yeah. in terms of the next few years. This is going to continue to be a problem because the rise, actually the rise in the number of people now living yeah. in the area is phenomenal. Absolutely. What is it that you would do, Mary McLeod, if you were MP, to improve the situation and get more affordable housing of whatever form built? We've already said that we will put much more money into the building of housing and getting affordable housing. So that will absolutely happen. Um, it's something, especially for London, and that's why um, Boris has announced a housing zone um, to promote the sort of the building in different areas. So that that so and how, of what you're, you're, is one of those. Because so are you fastest. pointing to what the mayor has has said already? He's just recently announced it as something that's going to happen in the next few years. So it's, it's, it's critical to, you know, there's lots of people who, who can't live in this area. Um, there there aren't enough like housing and it's the, the cost of housing. Trying to nail down, trying to get something that is concrete that people can go away and know is going to happen. What would you say? What would you point them to? More money to build more homes that are affordable within, within the Hounslow Borough. Okay. Do you know F how from much? From where? In the context of uh, Osborne's uh, announcements in terms of cutting uh, public expenditure back another 40%. But it's all about you to make choices in government. That's yeah. what politics is about. You make choices about how you spend the money. Uh, yes. But, uh, 
I, 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 you know, we've heard of... Uh, and we, we say housing's important? Yes. Uh, Therefore, we are committed to it. Well, the Conservative yes. government okay. says housing's important, uh, okay. uh, I'm sure we're defense is important, police is important, health is important, education is important. I can't actually work out whether... the conversation is in the direction of, the sort of, of, of Westminster and, and, you, and effectively your leaders and the national parties. And I'm sure we'll come back to local issues when we go uh, to questions from the floor. Um, I wonder how you would describe yourselves. I, I mean, I suppose we have your record, Mary McLeod, but Ruth Cabri, are you, a, are you somebody who votes always with your party? Or would vote always with your party? Well, I, I would generally vote with my party because, uh, you know, I believe, I, li I believe in the party I'm a member of. Uh, I've already told uh, my members in the party that there are probably, if it came to it, to two issues where I, I, I wouldn't uh, vote with my party. I hope it, it doesn't. Uh, one, I one is on, on Heathrow. If the decision was to expand Heathrow, and, uh, then uh, and I, was for, I, would, I would not vote uh, in the lobby with that. But I would hope I wouldn't be in that position. I'd hope I'd been able to <coughs> influence my party not to take that line. Uh, and the other, as a Quaker, I wouldn't vote to go to war. Ever? Ever. Under any circumstances? Under any circumstances. What about you, Mary McLeod? Would you vote, would you vote against your party on Heathrow? Yes. And um, I've said that right from the start. And in fact, what I did was, when I got selected first, I, I guess, I'm not sure the party had a particular view in it then. Um, and uh, I went to them and tried to persuade them, with some people in this room, and tried to persuade them that I thought uh, the, the third runway at Heathrow was the wrong thing. Um, if we need aviation capacity, there are other places okay. to do it. And we have managed to um, persuade them to, to say no to a third runway. So that's been the policy of this government for this term, was no third runway at Heathrow. We do have the commission who are doing work now to see where we're going to and it could very well the, be. And there are two Heathrow options. There's yeah. a Gatwick option. Okay. And so... Uh, is there another we'll area that, that you know now that you would vote against your government on? No. Um, it was something may come up, I suppose. But um, at the moment, I mean, Heathrow is the most obvious one. Have you ever voted against the government? A not in this term. I, because the government's policy on Heathrow is no third run rate. How much have you had no, to I'm hold your... No, I'm saying no, because okay. no, of the, no, the, no, the, no. the one issue that no. I said I'd vote. OK, so how much have you had to hold your nose while so, uh, sometimes... <laughs> <you're going laughs> uh, um, I don't think I've ever had to hold my nose down the lobby, uh, but... No, but you know what I mean. I mean, I wonder if how, uh, how many times, or have you ever found it very difficult thinking, I really don't want to do this, but I don't feel that I have much of a choice to... I don't think so. I mean, it's... Um, really? I, yeah. Have you ever avoided votes? Uh, not been there on the night? I'm presuming no. if, I, if I'm, I'm not there, If have. I'm not there on the night, it's because I'm here doing something um, or uh, got, got something else urgent on. I mean, it's, it's a no. Right. And it, OK, both of your leaders. I imagine that when you go on the doorstep, you're both slightly smiling at this. <laughs> that they are... Well, I wonder how, you, how you're greeted, because let, let's do the shorthand sort of cartoon. You're, David Cameron is arrogant and out of touch. Ed Miliband, people can't see him as a leader. He's just not going He's not going to be in Downing Street. That's the shorthand. And I just wonder, let's start with you, Ruth Cadbury, if I may, about the difficulty on the doorstep. Is there a difficulty on the doorstep? Do people say, do you know what, I, I like you, I like Labour, but, you know, that man... I, <laughs> I, I, get, I, I get it about everybody. They, 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 I get people who loved Tony Blair or hated Tony Blair. They loved Gordon Brown, they hated Gordon Brown. They loved David... <laughs> 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 said, bring back David Miliband, or, oh, oh, I'm so glad that, you, that, that, that Ed Miliband uh, won that ballot, uh, and they like, and and they where like are Ed you? Miliband. where are you? Uh, I voted for Ed Miliband, and I think he's, he's, he's had to grow into the position, because, um, he, you know, he, he's had less time to, 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 to grow into the position than, than David Cameron. I think he's doing well. I okay, think and he, you are he, a member of the GMB union? I'm a member of the GMB, yes. I'm not a sponsored... Uh, uh, candidate. I just wonder how much, because of course obviously the union, how much they inform or influence the way that you vote and the way that you, you um, act? Uh, 
N not at all, in the okay. sense of telling me how to vote. No, I mean, uh, the, 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 the unions Your are very important. Are. To, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, the, the, the history of the Labour Party, the history of mm. the union movement are very closely aligned, uh, uh, and, and we have a lot in common, and it's very, very important that we work closely with the unions because they've achieved so much and informed so much in terms of workers' <coughs> rights. Okay. Uh, but it's and more so that you have a, a, an alignment of views rather than you are uh, influenced or... Know, ever refer or take advice. Yeah, yeah. Or... Okay. Okay. What about you, Mary McLeod? How often are you in a situation where you're saying, honestly, I'm not out of touch. I'm a broad. I don't know. I mean, I imagine the Scottish heritage helps a bit when you're trying to prove that you're well, a little bit more earthy than those. those well, in, those I was actually born in London. I just have a strange accent, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I moved. I moved up to the Scotland when I was three. My parents moved, um, but I was yeah, I was born in St Thomas's Hospital. Uh, but do you but, find yourself sort of apologising for the lot in you know, kind of the who are, seem a little bit out of touch? Nice today, when we were uh, the Prime Minister was announcing these schools. We were at the Green School in Isleworth, and we literally had hundreds of screaming young girls. Um, uh, now, I'm not sure that's, I can say that reflects everyone <laughs> across the country who would, who, would, who would scream and run after him, but um, it, was, it, was, it was quite intriguing. Um, I, think, I, mean, I think, David, I've been really surprised at how much access and time I get to spend with the Prime Minister. I never would have expected it. Um, he has had a really op you know, an open door policy for any of us as backbenchers to go in and speak to him in his shoes. Particularly for women, because he's got a problem with women. Yeah, and we're all very vocal. So, so we like telling him what we think. Well, do, and, do you tell him he has a problem oh, with women? No, I don't tell him he's got a problem with women. Um, it's more I, I talk about policy ideas and, and things that I want him to do. And um, so whether it's schools or anything else, I'm trying to get him to. But okay. he, but he you literally don't tell him that, but does he? But I, I don't think he does. I mean, I don't, I think, I'm not sure what the polls are saying at the moment, but, the, um, but I don't understand why if he does, because if you think about it, I think we've done a lot for women in, in this country in the last few years, more women in work than ever before, more female businesses than ever before. Um, you know, he was the one who stood up before 2010 and said to um, Conservatives, I really need more women to come forward as politicians. We need to up our numbers because they're woefully bad. Um, and women came forward to do that. So he is so you absolutely okay. behind. So in that, in that sense, many of well, I'm just wondering, you never find yourself sort of apologising or excusing on the doorstep and... No, because I think what people do is is and they're and they're fair and people you know say let's let's judge you on your record. They they judge me and my record and they'll decide on the day whether they think I've done enough. Um, and they judge the prime minister. And if you look at what's happened locally, you know my, our unemployment here has gone it's gone down thirty nine percent and youth unemployment down fifty percent. You know we've had nine thousand four hundred new businesses, two thousand four hundred new apprenticeships. So those things are things that people say even in really difficult times in twenty ten we have managed. You know, just very briefly, because well, we're going to go out for I questions. Mean, let's just go back to, 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 uh, to, don't go to back David. Don't too far. No, just, just da <laughs> you know, David Cameron. Um, what happened to the Greenest government? What happened to the big society? And what happened to no ifs, no buts, no okay. third What's runway? What's your response to the jobs record, though? <laughs> Still no third runway. What's your response to the jobs record, though? Because that is a strong one, given where we were in 2010 when people were fearing about the economy. So many people who are no longer unemployed or not unemployed are on zero hours contracts, poorly paid part-time work, too many people I meet are having to uh, really, really struggle to make ends okay. meet. And, and so we've product, taken the poorest and pro out of tax altogether, and pro which and makes a real difference. I, okay. it, it, doesn't, it doesn't feel like that to those people. And productivity is one of the worst in, in, okay. in Europe. Ladies, thank you for the moment. Let's uh, get the house lights up, if we may, and we will uh, take some questions from the audience. Mary, <coughs> thank you very much. Fascinating. Uh, the first duty of the government is the defence of our country. And I'm, as an ex-salesman, very concerned about the fact that uh, Mr Cameron may be reducing the defence of our country below the 2% which he recommended that all NATO countries should, should aspire to. And uh, well, let's start with you, Ruth Cadbury, on that. Because I imagine you're, that's, you'd be happy to see it. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I, well I, I, you know, I have to, 
to be quite honest, I'm not the best person to ask about defence. <laughs> you know, I, I, I spent my gap year in New York at the, with the Quakers uh, at the first special session on disarmament, and, and Costa Rica had no army. But don't worry, I won't, uh, uh, you know, th those are my... Well, per it's, that, that, it's that's very, but it's very interesting, yeah, that, because it, there are a lot of people who yeah, have, may have a yeah. huge amount of sympathy with you yeah. and, or, or agree with you. What is it that you would do, if you were in a position to influence on defence... What is it that you well, would do? My, my perspective on arms and defence com, comes, uh, comes from my faith, and, I, and I'm not sure that I should impose that on, on other people. It, it, it's, it's fundamental to where I am personally, um, and I accept that I'm at odds not only with many, uh, much of the country, but also many people in my own party. Thank you. Mary um, I'm a bit different. I mean, I didn't know a lot about defence when I became the MP, so I decided to join the RAF. Um, so I now spend 15 days a year in uniform with the Royal Air Force, and I'm um, also president of the Royal British Legion in Chiswick. Yeah. Um, and I must say, it's just taught me so much about what our troops do. And I've been to Afghanistan to see Camp Bastion and the work they're doing. Because what I discovered was that the work we do there is not just about um, there. So if you take Afghanistan, it's not just about getting rid of the Taliban. It's not just about building up an Afghan army of 80,000. It's also about transformational change, where under the Taliban, no girls were educated, now three and a half million. There's no communications under the Taliban. Now there's 100 TV and radio stations, lots of infrastructure structure improvements. So it really is um, you know, a, a okay, amazing work they do. But in we terms won't of the question... The, we won't get into the discussion about the effects but the of question, what was achieved I, in, in Afghanistan. The question was specifically 2%. about whether 2%. Yeah, I would the, push the Prime Minister to try and, and do 2%. Um, he's not, he hasn't committed to it yet. Um, but, uh, but, but I, I mean, I, what, what, he's, what he is very strong on is that the defence of the realm is one of the most important things that a government has to he do. He maybe, but it's the Chancellor uh, he's got the problem with, isn't it? Because it, it's him who was it's, saying, no, you know, pushing well, it, back Well, it goes back to this thing about choices and where you put the money and, um, and what he feels and what he feels in times of austerity that it's, and there still is times of austerity, we haven't paid off all the debt yet, so we, we have to, um, you know, keep that in, take that into account. But it, it certainly, I would push them to 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 get to that two percent um, because I do think it is incredibly important. Okay. Can we go to the lady in the striped T-shirt before I come to you in a bit because she had her hand up very early? <coughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Claire and I am a Labour supporter, but I've got a neutral question. I think Mary, you talked about track record. Can I ask you, Mary, what's been your greatest achievement as an MP, nationally or locally, and what would it be if you were elected for another term? And Ruth, what's been your greatest achievement locally, and what would you aim for it to be if elected? Mary, we, we, you started with Mary, so what, what would you point to as your greatest achievement as an MP? Uh, I mean, I love the fact we now have four schools that we didn't have before, so the, the schools would, would, would be one. Um, you know, the 2,400 apprenticeships, um, you know, I run a jobs fair every year in Isleworth, and that has been, has hopefully helped in bringing down that unemployment, bringing businesses together with people who actually need work. Um, so those are the probably the, the biggest things. Um, I've done lots of work with small businesses um, locally as well. So okay. whether what are you most disappointed about? Perhaps something that when you became an MP you thought I can do this and you've struggled to do. Um, oh, there's always more one can do. <laughs> um, what sort of tops the list of? Because if you're if you're out on May the seventh, what will you look back and think? If only, if only I'd done that. The one thing that I still get really upset about is the and is something that is a starts in Chiswick, and that was Chiswick was the home of the first ever um, viol uh, refuge for domestic violence, and the figures now are even worse than before, um, and it's largely more people are reporting domestic violence and abuse, and that is good. But, you know, it is absolutely horrific that two women a week in this country still get killed by a partner or a former partner. One in three women will experience it in their lives and about one in six men. You know, this is something that is endemic. 
and we have to do something more to, to deal with it. Um, and we have just, uh, we've had £10 million from refugees from the Home Secretary and £5 million from Boris. But, you know, it's just, it's the you know, tip of the iceberg. It's such a big issue. And we've got to start in schools, get that message across that violence should not be tolerated. And whether, you know, it's anything to do with this forced marriage and, and everything that extends from these issues. And I'm happy to say I agree with Mary on that. Um, my biggest... Uh, uh, I think I think uh, what I'm most proud of uh, of being a councillor is uh, tackling uh, the government uh, on Heathrow, and we uh, after the Terminal Five inquiry, where um, obviously the decision went against Hounslow, we'd spent uh, a million or even two million on on the public inquiry and got nothing, uh, and I felt that, that this just wasn't uh, good enough. Um, so uh, we started um, a, a proper campaign uh, and we invested in a, a lot less than we did in the inquiry, uh, but in actually <coughs> um, uh, paying, I guess you could lobbyists actually, but, but people who would help us to uh, get our message across uh, in, in, in government, in parliament and so on. And as a result of that, and uh, the, 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 we, we um, got the 25 million for schools noise insulation and even with a, trans, uh, a transition of power in Hounslow and, and Barbara Reid took on that work after me, um, uh, the, civil aviation, the first civil aviation bill, we got a guarantee from government that we wouldn't have had otherwise uh, in terms of retaining runway alternation, uh, retaining the night, rate, night flight regime, which we were in danger of losing right. um, and, and getting proper mitigation. You hardly ever hear a defensive lobbyist, and there you're saying this was partly as a re largely yeah. as a result of employing lobbyists. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, in fact, you know, I came through student politics. A lot of the people I grew up with politically became lobbyists, and I thought they were all evil and only working for the nasty capitalists. When I actually talk to people, um, when I, you know, you meet people at events uh, uh, years, you know, years down the line, you say, oh, what do you do now? And they explain, and I said, oh, well, you know, did, did, why is it always capitalist? And they told me about clients they had who were public sector organisations, local authorities, uh, and, and third sector organisations. And I thought, well, we should do that for Hanslow. And, and I did, and it was the first time it has ever been done, and it's still, it's still being used. Nick, there's a gentleman so right by you there. Let's go there. And then... Hi, um, my name is Phil, and I'm a... Uh, is it Chiswickian? Chiswickian. Yeah. Um, Hi, Phil. The candidates both spoke about um, Heathrow and yeah. Third Runway, and I just wanted to, to get their opinions on another burning issue, which is the Thames Tideway Tunnel, which I think has just got planning permission, and it's set to cause a lot of disruption all along the river, all along London. It's a... Uh, Sort of London-wide issue with lots of MPs and candidates are talking about it. So I just wanted to get the opinions of the floor on the project. Mm -hmm. Where are you both on that? I don't know what... Well, isn't enough. I get no post bag on, on that at all. I'm not saying people aren't concerned about it, um, but they, they don't write to me on it. Um, I think it's because Chiswick is slightly less affected. Mind you, some, some of the sort of work, just like we see with when the, Hammer, the Hammersmith flyover is closed, we still get an effect in Chiswick. So that may, may still happen. Um, but, a, but, but the, you know, the, the Thames Water will say they absolutely need to do it um, because all of our old pipes and everything else are, are so old and they're, they, they can't take the capacity. So it's, um, but it'd be interesting to see if anyone else is sort of interested in, mm. in this, but I don't get much in my course back about it. What about you, Ruth? Well, as somebody who's learnt to uh, canoe, kayak actually, at, at Chiswick and spent several summers uh, enjoying kayaking up and down the Thames and even as far as the Millennium, uh, uh, Millennium Bridge uh, a couple of times, um, I am quite keen that uh, the water on the Thames should be clean. Um, and... Uh, I, I, the, the Tideway Tunnel is an essential piece of infrastructure uh, investment uh, that we have we we have to do, uh, and the other thing that has to happen uh, is we have to address what still seems to be the problem at Mogden Sewage Works because it's still discharging into the Thames and it shouldn't be. Okay, yeah. I think you've been, you've been that. Can I ask you just uh, sinking the A4? Both in favour? 
Well, it's not for, if it's at the moment the it's it's the, the, the proposal know, at the moment says Hammersmith, but um, but it, but, oh, the, oh, but there it? could yeah. Oh, so okay, it, but it, but it may affect us eventually. It may do. Um, Apologies, I'm not knowing your boundaries. That's, that's quite all right. Well, but, it, but it may still affect it, and because depends. they might start earlier, the the well, the tunnel. Going. <laughs> yes, yes, a good, good point. Uh, and then probably you'd build over it. Um, well, but. you'd only be able to fund it by, by building over it. I think, the, I think the proposal to sink it in, in Hammersmith itself, uh, just the well, actual overpass... Far enough. Well, yeah. if, if you replace just the current overpass in Hammersmith <laughs> yeah, no, by, with a tunnel, yeah. I think that's feasible. Uh, it, to lengthen it, I think, as far as... In fact, almost Hogarth roundabout, it would come up near Fuller's. Yeah. I think that would cause massive pollution to that area of, of Chiswick because the traffic doesn't go away. Okay. Interesting. Uh, the gentleman there, please, with a green, I don't know how to describe it, white beard, am I allowed to say? Santa. That? Santa, Santa Claus. Claus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm Paul Lynch at, at Chiswick Councillor. We've all been tremendously impressed and encouraged by uh, the growth in business, um, particularly in Chiswick, but also in the rest of the borough. Are our transport links uh, holding this back, do, they, do we think? Well, they, I mean, I've, I've tried to do a lot with business, um, whether it's big and small, uh, over the last five years. Um, and we've set up a Chiswick Traders Group here um, to listen to businesses. <coughs> um, and, I, and I run another meeting with, with, with some of the bigger businesses. Um, and, uh, and it is important because we need the jobs, and so therefore the transport has to match that. The, the two things um, uh, that we've done on transport, the Piccadilly line at Turnham Green was something that when I came here first, lots of residents talked to me about the Piccadilly line at Turnham Green. So um, I worked with them and, helped, and picked up that campaign and we've, now, and we've managed to get Boris to agree after a lot of, th thank you for those people here who filled in the surveys and did the petition, um, it really did make a difference because when TfL did the consultation they realised actually that people really cared about it. Um, and uh, so we've now got agreement for the Piccadilly line to stop at Turnham Green. It won't happen until the Piccadilly line is upgraded and that upgrade won't take place probably until about 2020. So what I'm still pushing on, I'm still pushing on, because I still, I still, we do have it, but it's some time away. So the, 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 the key thing now is to try and get, in the meantime, is to try and get some more off-peak stopping. Um, right. Because it's, it, what they say is that at peak times, you would need two extra trains and why buy two expensive two new trains if you're then going to re replace the whole thing. So that's the first thing. The second thing is Gunnersbury Station just further along, um, where given the Chiswick Business Park has, has been really successful, um, Brompton, a, sorry, a, the Brentford a Football Club has, is moving, there's the Octopus, there's lots of new developments happening around there, um, changes, um, footfall will continue to increase. So we're working on trying to get a bridge over to a, the Chiswick Park station and also improve Gunnersbury station. So we're working together as a, as a group on that and I've established a, a, a working group to make that happen. Okay. I remember standing with Anne Keane uh, outside Turnham Green station asking, for, demanding that the Piccadilly line stops at Turnham Green many, many years ago. Um, so I mean, we've also been campaigning uh, for, for that. But I've got a result. It may be 2020, I've got a result. I think it, it was probably going to come sooner or later, but it, need, it needed, it wasn't going to happen until that massive upgrade on the Piccadilly line line happened. But, we, you know, um, the Labour, Labour Party locally and um, Hounslow Council has also been uh, working on that issue for a long time. Um, I, I've had the, the lead role uh, on, the uh, on the Council for Regeneration Economic Development. I've also worked with small businesses. I'm proud of having uh, role, been responsible for rolling out half hour free parking. Uh, in, that was something in, I pushed the Council on. I, um, really, I don't remember I went, getting a letter I went from to the you, Council Mary. and pushed the Council on 30 minute free yeah, parking, I which we now have. Is it true that that Chiswick High Road is the most Find yes, it is, yeah. and it's the council's fault. I mean, it's absolutely <laughs> ridiculous, yeah. absolutely ridiculous that it's the highest in the country. I'm fed up with the council well, pushing Chiswick to, to the side and not well, maybe, maybe, maybe Mary, you should bring, you should blame TfL and their nasty buses that keep trying to want to have access down the high road, <laughs> and that keeps being blocked we by people buses, parking we need selfishly. Public transport. Um, 
you know, there, uh, you know, there, there is a massive conflict uh, of, of uh, traffic demand in London. London is desperately congested, and uh, it, it causes all sorts of problems. Uh, and if we could, you know, the more buses we can get, the better. And we do make sure we get more buses uh, coming out of Section 106 agreements from from uh, planning decisions. Um, uh, so that, and, and we, but we need to persuade people to use buses uh, and other public scandal. transport. And and it may be and just because people are breaking the law, though. I mean, uh, yeah, you know, exactly. But why have they got so many cameras in Chiswick? Because they think they can make money out of Chiswick. You know, they don't put yeah, 30-minute free parking yeah. on Chiswick High Road. <laughs> Because of public demand. Okay, let's There's get a demand microphone. Independent shops and Chiswick High Road. The lady in the back row on the left. Uh, hi, my name's Rudy, and uh, I'm also a Chiswick Queen. Chiswick Queen? Chiswick Queen. So, I guess I, I appreciate what was said earlier about <coughs> there's, there's a lot of people in London who, um, who you know, want to get housing and are struggling, but just as a more sort of, in our Chiswick bubble, uh, we're quite fortunate that most of us have good jobs, we're really hard, we pay our taxes. Um, but I recently had three, um, I recently had twins, they're now three years old, and basically my entire salary, and it's a decent salary, you know, I pay, um, I pay my taxes, I pay higher rates, uh, my entire salary is basically on childcare. Uh, so, Ruth, particularly for you, because this morning I got a leaflet in my door saying that you're going to make me £1,600 richer and 25 hours of free childcare. Yeah. And I was wondering if that was a general policy for all working mums basically really trying to stay in the workforce, so if it was something just for people on kind of um, basic tax rate or unemployed people or... No, thank you very much. That's a very important question because um, childcare in Chiswick, some, some of the childcare providers in Chiswick are charging three, pa three times the, the <coughs> borough average. The community nursery is probably the cheapest. Mm? It's a community nursery. So it's, it's probably it's not it's not it's one, one of the cheaper ones. You know, it's a, it, but it's a lovely yeah, community and nursery. and I also understand there are something like only seven childminders now in Chiswick. So we have we have a childcare crisis uh, in Chiswick, and and uh, the council is doing what it can yeah, to encourage can't people. Be what, only seven childminders. So this is seven or eleven. It's a tiny number. I mean, I it, it's I know crazy. That many. Yeah, well, th th you probably know them all, um, and, and and particularly, you know, that some people prefer nurseries for their children. Some people prefer so, childminders. So we prefer so childminders. What, what's the offer from uh, the 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 offer is um, it's t it's twenty five hours free for working parents for three and four year olds, uh, which is uh, ten hours more than uh, the Conservatives are offering. Um, Okay. And the £1,600? Um, that, that, yeah, is, is that... Is, is, is that that... Um, Does it mention the mansion tax? If you <laughs> And, and, um, <laughs> well, in Chiswick, I mean, that's, actually, that's a very good point in Chiswick as well. And I'm just thought yeah. generally the kind of the cost of living is not just something no. that affects people, yeah. like the kind I of mean, the bottom end, which obviously yeah. that's a really serious issue. But in Chiswick, we're kind of... Absolutely, absolutely, and I've met people who uh, aren't, uh, you know, are holding off having children um, because they are, they either need because they're worried about the costs of childcare, and, and, and more and more so is um, they can't get out of the flats they're in because they can't afford uh, to buy a family home. What we um, have started is tax-free childcare, which was something that actually it was the women in Parliament did. Um, it was one of the first things where we got together and we said we must really try and push for this, um, and it took us a while, but we eventually got got people listening and we've got it. Yeah, the sixteen hundred pounds. Um, I don't know if it's the same £1,600, but I know that most people in this country, as a direct result of tax and benefit changes, are £1,600 uh, a, a year worse off. And, and, and families with children, uh, particularly average and low-income families, are the worst off as a direct result of benefit and income changes. So it's not <laughs> Gentlemen there. Thank you. David Dewhurst... Um, on behalf of the anti-tax dodging bill campaign, who are composed of about 17 national groupings like Oxfam and Christian Aid. And they're proposing, they're lobbying all candidates for the parliamentary election to ask them whether they will support in the first 100 days of the new parliament the introduction of an anti-tax dodging bill. We all know that Labour was 
rather sort of light touch in the previous administration, very much supported by the Conservatives. We all know that there have been certain bits of rhetoric uh, against it in the with the current Parliament, but anybody who reads private time with inside stages, pages of the FT knows that it's, it's a trickle, and while the bottom 10% pay 47% of their income in taxes, the top 10% it's down to uh, about, uh, I'm looking at my figures here, yeah, 41%. But I'm not interested in those, I'm interested in Google, Microsoft, Apple, who are collectively paying less than Iceland uh, supermarkets in okay. taxes. What are we going to do about that? Mary McLeod, what... They've got, what about companies like Google? Have they got away with too much for too long with being able to? We, we absolutely need to get on top of it. It's, abs it's not fair for any large organisation, small organisation to be getting away, or individuals, to be getting away with not paying the tax that they should be paying, um, whereas other hard-working people like okay, people here have to pay. What's the answer? Because uh, they would argue we are paying the tax we should be paying. We're abiding by the rules as they stand. What well, we have, to, we, have, we have to change those rules and close the loopholes. Um, and because the, Change the rules, for example, to ensure that uh, you are taxed where you make your money, where you, where you have your earnings. Yeah, it could be. I mean, it's I mean, interesting. Starbucks headquarters is in Chiswick, um, and what they they would say is that they spend lots of money in buying leases on properties them over a long period of time. They overdid it, um, and therefore they 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 had to pay put the, pay, pay that money back, and therefore that's why they didn't they weren't making profits. The difficulty is, uh, you know, people look at them on the high street and say, well. We feel you're making profits because we're all buying our coffees and there or elsewhere. But, but it's you know so it's the, you if there, if there are these loop, if there are any loopholes at all that are preventing businesses pay their fair share of tax because we've got the, a low corporation tax now you know so we've done what we can for businesses. Yeah. Um, it's just like, a lot of people have heard this again and again over yeah. years. We've been talking about they must do we must close loopholes and they must pay their tax. But I think it's through work of sort of many organisations it really has the visibility of this has gone right up the scale. Okay, but um, what's going to change as a result of that? So we all talk about it. What changes? Yeah, well, well as I say, you, you have to change the, the loopholes. So look at the things where people are saying that that's legal, but, but we're still doing it. Um, a, tackle those organisations who appear to be using those loopholes and, and coming down hard on them from a Treasury point of view. Um, and then, you know, really creating that, um, I would say, name and, name and shame them. Um, so that, because I think they, that does make it really damage their reputations, um, okay. and it certainly Ruth did to Starbucks and others. Um, of course, we should close loopholes. I once met somebody who recently met somebody who works for one of the big accountancy firms, and he said his firm alone saves their clients billions of tax. I and mean, that is just shocking, and that's just one firm. Um, of course, if we have regulation, uh, we should have regulation, whether that's by statute or by changing the, rule, the, 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 the tax regulations, I don't know. And I know the Labour Party's, uh, the Labour leadership is looking uh, at the mechanisms in order to address tax avoidance. But you're not going to do anything unless, until you change the culture. And I don't have a lot of confidence with the Conservative Party when one of their <coughs> leading lords basically said, it's all right, isn't it? Everybody's doing it. Donor should be part of this too. Let's not point the finger on this. We're, I'm saying anyone, and whether it's whether it's Conservative voters or Labour voters, anyone who is trying to dodge tax in that way should absolutely be penalised. Okay. Another but they're question. out of line with the main part uh, of the Labour Party. If they are in the red jumper here, please. Thank you very much. My name is Barbara Reed. I'm completely biased. I'm Mary McLeod's campaign. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let the red sweater put, put, put you off. A no. Question. Um, there must be by now thousands of properties in Chiswick which are worth over a million, two million, three million. But we know that there are people who are property rich but cash poor. Mm. Given that, is can I have the candidates, well, the MP and the candidates' view on Labour's proposal for a mansion tax, and do they think it's fair? Okay. Um, I'm going to focus on Ruth because you obviously know. I presume you know your your uh, Mary's view on it. And Ruth, particularly in a constituency like this, the mansion house must be a hard sell. Uh, surprisingly, I don't. I haven't had 
that many people raising it when we've knocked on the doors. And, it, and it's mainly, it affects Chiswick. That's the only part of the constituency where uh, there's, the there's an, any, any uh, properties. And are, some are, others. Are, 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 there's a very few. Lots but uh, but are you aware few. of people who are effectively yes, property I, rich yeah. but cash well, poor? Well, for, first of all, this is part of the funding package for the NHS. Um, and, uh, and we, you know, we have, we have to raise taxes and we have to find funding from somewhere. Secondly, people who are asset rich and cash poor will not be paying it, Barbara, and you know that. It's only higher rate, ta only higher rate taxpayers will pay it. Um, sorry, haven't you read Labour Party briefing? Sorry. Um, I thought you might have done. Um, uh, so, so, so higher rate, uh, uh, anybody who's not a higher rate taxpayer won't be paying it. Uh, they will, it will be rolled over in, 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 into the property. Uh, it'll be rolled over into the property when, when the property is sold. And I don't think that is, I don't think that is, that is a problem. Um, and it isn't, some people also say it's more, more bureaucratic than an alternative way of uh, increasing the number of tax bans. The answer is no, because your government brought in a mechanism whereby uh, people who avoid uh, t uh, property taxes by putting their property, their, their home into a company. Um, your government has brought in a, a, a loophole prevention measure, which is fine, um, uh, that, that, that uh, ensures that uh, properties are over the current two million um, are, are taxed. So we'll be using that mechanism uh, through HMRC. So the mechanism is there. But it does worry me because I think once you start something like that, then it's very easy for that level to, to slip. No, no, we've committed. We've committed. I'm just saying, I think I'm, I'm yeah, answering now. It you, may be easy. No, but we made it very clear that it's, it's, it's these levels that were then worth time. two million. So, so you start a policy. The concern is that what the threshold at two million will be dropped to one million. Yeah, over, over time. And I just no, think there, we've and committed that a lot of the a lot of I mean, Chiswick uh, house property prices, you know, similar to Hammersmith and elsewhere, Van Fulham, it is they are expensive, you know, and and this. I was just standing um, in Sainsbury's do, uh, in meeting and greetings. I try and meet as many residents as I can. And, and this lovely old lady came up to me and she said, my father fought for this country, my grandfather fought for this country. And she said, I can't afford the mansion tax. So, you know, it's just... But she wouldn't it's, be it's, She's absolutely... But she's, but people like that are... But she's are, probably in a minority. There are probably far more people in the... In the but there, are a lot of, there are a lot of people who, um, because of the cost um, of property and here, it really is, and they're paying for childcare and other things. I mean, it, you know, they don't necessarily have lots of spare cash to, to pay out a mansion tax. I'm completely against it. OK. Uh, I'm being directed to the gentleman here, so it's obviously going to have a very important question. <coughs> with glasses. My name's Dave, I'm a Labour Party supporter. I've got a, a question here. When the coalition came in, they increased the right to buy discount from £17,000 to £70,000. Now £100,000. And now £100,000, basically. And they promised that they would build one council house for every one soul. Now, the current figures, according to the Financial Times, are that one council house is being built for every 11 sold. Mm. And I understand that the Conservative Party is, some elements in the Conservative Party, now want to extend right to buy to housing associations at a cost of an enormous public subsidy. What I want to know is, are you in, what will you do to make sure that the promise that we were given, that one social home sold will be replaced by another social home will actually be carried out in the next government. Well, I think... I think that's slightly above my pay grade. It's the, probably the Prime Minister who can give you that guarantee, but I, I will ask him for you. Um, but, um, but, it's, but I, you know, I do think it's... It's hard to defend that, isn't it? Um, Is it possible to defend it? I I don't know to be honest. I mean, in terms of the, I, I will I will I will raise it there with him and see and see what his response is. But I mean, I think looking forward, I mean, I do think right to buy is is important. We do need to build more homes. Okay, but if you're going to um, if you're going to allow people to buy, then you need to you need to build. You need, you need to build more. Yeah, and it absolutely. needs to be on a one to one. And it I'm not, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure it needs to be on a one-to-one, -one, but I think you do need to make sure you've well, got, that's the, what you've got to, you have, committed to. You've got to have the capacity um, that's, that's required. I mean, we've had, what, there's been 10,000 people on the house.
housing waiting list. It's literally been changed. Um, the the bandings um, and been reviewed. But you know, there's a lot of people out there it's looking difficult for homes. Though, that whole thing is if you say you're going to do something and then you don't do it. Well, I mean, it's there, but there's a lot of things we have done. So, you know, I think in government, but I, but I think in government, what, uh, in government, what you have to do is we, we have inherited a huge mess in 2010. We have managed to turn that around. Yes, it was a mess. And what we've tried to do is turn that we around. We've reduced unemployment. We've increased the numbers of businesses. We, we absolutely have got the economy back onto growth again. But it is growing. It is growing. We're the fastest growing economy in the developing world. But there's more to do. Hence, I need to be re-elected for another five years. at the end, not now though. We're coming near the end, so just, I appreciate you're getting a little fidgety. Um, Ruth Cabbage, you want to, to I, I guess you're going to say yes. It's uh, I, I what can it, you I, do I, though? I, I, the question specifically was, what can you do to guarantee that the, well, it's one for one? We have to go back. The position we, the Labour government was in before was that we didn't stop the right to buy. Uh, but we, the, the, the discount was very, very low, enough to acknowledge the, the, the levels of rent that people put in. But remember, rent, rent funds management and borrowing costs. It doesn't, it doesn't fund the actual purchase itself. So, um, uh, so we had a very small discount, um, but we were, we were forbidden from building uh, n new homes. We couldn't. We couldn't build new homes with that money. Now, the government, on the one, the, the Conservative government, on the one hand, uh, said, "Oh, it's all right. You can now use that funding for for building new new, new social rented homes." Ah, oh, but we're going to put the discount up so high that actually there isn't in, that, that there isn't enough uh, to bi to build uh, until you, to build one home until you've sold five, eleven, or whatever it is. Um, and and trying to find trying to find the funding. I mean. Hounslow's doing well. Hounslow is on, on a programme to deliver between four and 600 new council homes. And the, the uh, uh, photo so of the me... So the government has helped with that? The, no. The, yeah. the, the, the photo of me with the hard hat on uh, was when, we, when I was um, laying the bricks on, on, on the, our first new council homes. But actually, those were funded under the previous Labour government. Okay. We are two months away from an election. <laughs> are you worried about how this debate is going to play out in terms of perhaps some of the venom and anger. I was just wondering about both of you, the relative, I mean, I argue it's two months away and it's arguably it started months before. I mean, are you both relishing the prospect of the weeks ahead, or are you? I love elections. I mean, this. I mean, I think. I mean, I, I've seen other countries around the world that don't have democracies, and you know, as we are lucky that we have the democracy we have. So, you know, I, I want people to engage in it. I think it's brilliant that there's so many people here tonight that that want to be that they're interested to come along and hear the discussion and participate in it. You know, we want Do that at of you all ages. Have a sense that we're more divided as a society than we have been in the past. I, I think we are. We're certainly the the gaps, uh, the, the the gap between the wealth and poverty in this country and in the, in this constituency is greater than it's ever been. Okay, but in We've, terms we, you of know, it people, playing into people political, political up discussion, to, hmm? does well, it play into political discussion? Well, I think yeah. that people end up being as passionate, um, and that's good because you know politics uh, and politics for some perhaps for many years has almost been a dirty word but actually what it is it's about things we care about so it's about you know the healthcare we get when we go to the doctor it's about the education our children receive it's about you know can we you know how do we have job to go to and do we get a salary coming in each each week each month you know those things are critically important and so what I'm really glad is that we can get the debate back to actually politics is about really important Things that we map the matter to each other. Yeah, and, and and I mean, what 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 drives that passion for me is talking to people themselves who have directly been impacted by the policies of this government, um, who, who've who've lost their jobs or on zero hours contracts. They don't know whether they'll have enough to feed their kids next week. Um, people, uh, young people who are facing the having to repay the debt on £9,000 tuition fees. But what we will Young be doing people, in the next you know, few et cetera, weeks... Et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and it's those and people... And those people and it's who are those, now employed and, it's and into those, work. And it's those people before. who say, okay. I wish I'd voted... But we will all be going around I doors I and... I know you can tell it's about to, to come everyone. to an end, so we're getting in the last little bit. I mean, when you, when you look at it... I mean, Mary, you've been MP for the last, what, five years now, absolutely. Yeah. Um, the polls don't look good. Now, I know you'd both say, I'm going to win. Of course you're going to say that. That's what you do. 
But I do wonder how you feel, given where we are in the polls. I mean, in Lord Ashcroft's poll, which was back in September, so maybe things have changed. Maybe you both feel things have changed. Was uh, He had, uh, of 1,000 people, Labour on 45%, the Conservatives on 32%. Yeah, and as I said, I mean, it will be neck and neck. Every single vote will count in this election. Of course, the only poll that matters is election day. And, you know, so much can change between now and the election. But, you know, this, it's, you know, that, as I say, this is sort of a healthy democracy. And, you know, Ruth and I and the other candidates will be out round the doors and, you know, trying to persuade people that we're worth voting for. And, um, you know, and I, and I say, you know, look at the last five years. I've tried to make a difference um, in, in several ways. I really want to build on that in, in the next five because this is about making a difference to people's lives and it's an okay. incredible, incredible privilege to have the role. You raised your eyebrows when Mary McLeod said neck and neck. Is it not neck and neck? Well, uh, you having just read out the Ashcroft figures, I... I uh, that was and, from uh, September. Uh, September. Uh, I, I don't... I, I have no sense that it's changed significantly uh, since then. Uh, you know, um, and I, Sorry, I'm not... You know, just going by the figures, uh, uh, the, the figures there are returns on the doorstep, uh, the, 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 the national polls and also the Ashcroft poll. Um, I, I'm... Um, what, confident of I just need to go and work harder. Yeah. <laughs> For the next yeah. few weeks. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Ruth Cadbury, Mary McLeod. Thank you very much.